Hey y'all, it's Dr. Nicole Richter back with another reading in my philosophy and film series in which I read some of the most important philosophical texts, at least in my opinion, and I share them with you and hope that you enjoy them as well. And often these readings might mention specific films, and so if you've seen them, that will add to your experience, or maybe after watching one of these videos, you'll want to go watch the film. But in general, they've been, um, you know, very uh, broad in their scope. But today, today's reading, which comes from a book, Philosophy Goes to the Movies, which is distinct from the book, Doing Philosophy at the Movies, um, the reading is goes into particular detail of uh, Bertolucci's Italian film, The Conformist. And so I definitely suggest watching that. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, the way that the chapter is written is it's very clear in how it's using examples from the film to highlight major concepts. So you will not have had to have watched it to listen to this reading. And maybe it will inspire you to, to, uh, to watch it if you feel like it is influential. So um, this film kind of broadly gives us a idea of different uh, philosophical strains within the study of philosophy and film. So I'm going to pull up the reading so you can read along. Now, I want to read this because I think that revisiting the conformist is particularly relevant because it ultimately makes the case that the influence of fascism has a lot to do with anti-philosophical thinking. And the film suggests that philosophy and learning philosophy is a uh, protective measure um, against people becoming fascist or falling into fascism which is to say that there's something unique about philosophy that the kernel of which, if we take into ourselves and take seriously, um, actually keeps us from being pulled into totalitarian forces that seek to supplant our beliefs and our ideas with those of an ideology. So this is particularly relevant, I think, at this point in time um, with what we're moving to is how to move past some of these uh, fascist um, movements that we're seeing uh, globally, but in, in this particular aspect of the United States. But I think seeing it from an Italian perspective, again, highlights this point that fascism takes, you know, can take various forms and philosophy can help us assess when something is taking a fascist turn. In Bertolucci's 1970 film, The Conformist, the protagonist, Marcello Clerici, joins the Italian fascist movement and develops a plan to assassinate his former mentor, a philosophy professor. This man, who has become the leader of an anti-fascist movement, is living in Paris as an exile. In one key scene, Clarici goes to visit the professor in his study. The professor reminds him that Plato's cave was the subject of his unfinished thesis. As they talk, Clarici recalls that when the professor entered the lecture room, he would always close the windows to keep out the light and noise. Clarici now goes to the window and closes the shutters himself, leaving only a shaft of light. He then recounts how the professor used to lecture on Plato's cave and begins to recite the myth. So why does Clarici close the shutters? What is Plato's cave doing in Bertolucci's film? And what is the significance for this tale of fascist delusion? What does this appearance of the cave in the film tell us about the cave story itself? We will come back to these questions shortly, but in order to answer them, it is necessary for us to pay a visit to Plato's cave. Plato's cave. Plato's cave is one of philosophy's most memorable and haunting images. I've already said a little about it in the introduction, but we can now start to explore it in more detail. In The Republic, Plato asks us to imagine prisoners living in a cadaverous cell down under the ground with a fire behind them. The prisoners who have been there since childhood are bound so they cannot turn their heads and can only see the shadows on the wall before them. These shadows are cast by artifacts, statuettes of people, and models of animals being carried by unseen figures behind them moving up and down in front of the fire. The prisoners 
think that the shadows are the only things there to see, the only reality there is. If they are released from their bonds and forced to turn around to see the fire and the statues, they become bewildered and disoriented and are much happier left in their original state. Only a few can bear to realize that what they only see are shadows cast by the artifacts, and these courageous few begin their journey of liberation that leads past the fire and right out of the cave. Here, outside the cave, they find not merely artifacts, but the real things, the objects of the real world. Moreover, should they return to the cave and tell of what they have seen, they will be viewed with great suspicion by those who remain, and no one will listen to or understand what they have to say. What makes the cave image so compelling is its suggestion that we might be like these prisoners, that everything we ordinarily take to be reality might in fact be no more than a shadow, a mere appearance, and that the real world might be something quite different. In our ordinary experience, of course, we are perfectly familiar with the apparent as well as the real and can usually tell the difference between them. The stick in water appears to be bent, but we can readily establish that it is really straight. But if absolutely everything that we encountered, everything in our ordinary experience was merely an appearance and illusion and quite different from what was really the case, we would have no idea that we were being systematically diluted in this way. We would imagine that we had genuine access to reality, that what we saw was all there was to see. And if anyone were able to pierce through this veil of appearances and to grasp the true nature of reality, they would view those left behind as no more than prisoners confined to a world of illusion. To them, everything that those left behind took to be solid reality would seem to be no more than shadows. There are a number of ways in which the cave story can be interpreted. First of all, it can be read very broadly as, quote, an invitation to think rather than to rely on the way things appear to us, end quote, from Blackburn in 1994. In other words, it is an invitation to engage in philosophical reflection. To start thinking philosophically about our beliefs, we have to abandon our unthinking confidence that what we ordinarily take to be knowledge really is knowledge. We have to become critical of received opinion and common sense beliefs, beliefs that are presented to us as self-evident or unquestionable. Secondly, the cave story illustrates Plato's own philosophical views about the nature of knowledge. Philosophers have always been interested in giving an account of knowledge, of the nature, scope, and limits of what we can know, an area of philosophical reflection that has come to be known as epistemology. The cave serves as a concrete representation of Plato's own epistemological position. It is a representation of his view that all our senses revealed to us are mere shadows, mere appearances removed from reality. For Plato, we are just like the prisoners in the cave, to the extent that we think the world we ordinarily encounter through our five senses is the real one. In order to comprehend the world as it really is, we have to escape from this prison. We have to go beyond what is given to us in experience. And in addition to serving as an illustration, the cave may also be seen as a thought experiment designed to question our ordinary reliance on the senses. In a setup of systematic deception like that of the cave, our senses would not be able to see through that deception and so cannot be relied upon. The cave image is also significant because it brings us to our first encounter between philosophy and the cinema. As I mentioned in the introduction, it has often been noted that there are uncanny similarities between the cave Plato imagines and the modern cinema. As in Plato's picture show, so too in the cinema, we sit in darkness, transfixed by mere images that are removed from reality. The very structure of the cinema parallels that of the cave. The cinema audience watches images projected onto a screen in front of them. These images are projected from a piece of film being moved past the light behind them, and the images on this piece of film are themselves merely copies of the real things outside the cinema. There are some striking parallels here. Indeed, if anything, the cinema improves on the cave as a place of illusion. What are being projected on the screen are not mere shadows, but sophisticated, highly realistic images. The history of the cinema is itself one of increasingly sophisticated representations of reality, with the progressive addition of sound and color making the illusion more and more complete. Moreover, through seamless editing, films usually do not call attention to the fact that they are merely representations of reality up on the screen and not reality itself, the so-called reality effect.
There is a sense then in which as Ian Jarvie puts it, we recreate Plato's thought experiment every time we step into a cinema. And it is always possible to think of the cinema itself in cave-like terms, as a refuge from reality, a place where we can go in order to escape from the outside world, to lose ourselves in deception, illusion, and fantasy. However, it is important to note that despite the clear similarities between the cinema and Plato's cave, there are also some significant differences. In particular, the kind of deception involved in Plato's account is much more profound than anything we might find in the cinema. If the cinematic image is a mere representation, an illusion, it is an illusion that we voluntarily subject ourselves to, which we allow ourselves to be taken in by, and in full awareness of its status as an illusion. That we are not seriously taken in by the cinematic image reflects the fact mentioned earlier that ordinarily we can distinguish perfectly well between illusion and reality, between the apparent and the real. We can do this even if the illusions are relatively sophisticated, like those we find in cinema. Moreover, leaving the cinema and returning to the real world all takes place within our ordinary experience, just as the distinctions we make between appearance and reality are ordinarily made within the realm of our ordinary experience. For Plato, in contrast, it is ordinary experience as a whole that is illusory. In order to escape from illusion and to comprehend reality, we have to escape entirely from the realm of ordinary experience. Plato's account does not only have to do with knowledge, but also with a certain kind of liberation bound up with knowledge. Ignorance for Plato is not bliss, but rather a form of enslavement. We are prisoners insofar as we are prevented from grasping the true order of things by the limits of everyday experience, the limits of our common sense understanding of the world. To gain knowledge is to escape from the imprisonment of our ordinary conception of the world. There is also a suggestion in Plato's account that ignorance can enslave us in a more concrete sense as well. Plato portrays the per portrays the prisoners as mistaking for reality the shadows of effigies that are being carried by others. The implication is that we can be effectively enslaved or controlled by other people when we take for reality the images they feed to us, when we believe what they want us to believe. Only if we become critical, if we come to see these false images for what they are, will we be in a position to free ourselves from this kind of enslavement. Seen in these terms, Plato's story of the cave, of imprisonment, and its overcoming starts to acquire wider resonances. It calls to mind, first of all, what is involved in the process of an individual's growing up, of leaving childhood behind, and of becoming an adult. This is more than a, simply a process of physical development. An important part of growing up is intellectual growth, in which we come to question the ideas and beliefs, along with the moral principles and standards, which have been fed to us by our parents, teachers, and others over the years. When we are young, of course, we uncritically accept whatever we are told about the world. As a result, we are very much influenced and determined in our thinking by the views, opinions, and attitudes of those around us. As we grow up, however, we often find that many things we have hitherto accepted without question are in fact questionable, and may even be false. In so doing, we start to become critical, to examine our existing beliefs and standards, to sift through them and weigh them up. Such critical thinking is an important part of breaking away from dependence on others and of establishing our own identity, our own views on the world, and our intellectual and personal independence. Secondly, <clears throat> the cave calls to mind forms of imprisonment and their overcoming in a wider social context. An important way in which people can be controlled or manipulated is by filling their heads with misleading or false images of the world. And this is a far more effective form of social manipulation than straightforward coercion, because here we are willingly doing what other people want us to do. Consider, for example, the advertising images manufacturers bombard us with designed to make us think that their products are indispensable to our well-being or happiness. Or consider the role of political propaganda in fostering certain views of the world or in orchestrating public opinion in various ways in order to help bring about the political goals of others. Movies, too, have sometimes been seen as part of this, as instruments of cultural or political indoctrination, encouraging people to mistake a false cinematic reality for the reality of life in the world. 
So in this wider social and political context as well, it would seem that we can become like Plato's prisoners, controlled by others because we take the images they present us with for reality. This is by no means to suggest that we are nothing more than passive, unthinking dupes completely at the mercy of these images, as some commentators have supposed. We can still differentiate between appearance and reality. What the possibility of such deception means, once again, is that it is important to be critical. Becoming critical of these images imposed on us, seeing them for what they are, and grasping the truth of our circumstances is an important part of breaking away from this kind of subjugation, of attaining some degree of independence in our lives. These are some of the wider implications of the cave image, and they are often alluded to in cinematic portrayals that make use of the cave. This brings us back to Bertolucci's The Conformist. As Julian Noss notes in An Introduction to Plato's Republic, Bertolucci uses Plato's cave image quite deliberately and explicitly in the film to comment on the imprisoning delusions of fascism. It does not appear in the Alberto Moravia book, uh, uh, Moravia book on which the film was based. Ferrici, having closed the shutters and turned his old philosophy professor's office into a gloomy cave-like place, recalls how the professor used to lecture on Plato's cave and how much of an impression that made on him. In response, the professor compares the deluded prisoners in the cave with the inhabitants of fascist Italy, blinded by propaganda. Since Carici is himself one of those who has been trapped and blinded, one of the cave dwellers, he is unaware of the irony of his own recollections. But Bertolucci underscores the professor's point, because there is enough light entering the room to cast shadows on the wall behind them. At one point in Clarici's exposition, as he is emphasizing a point, his shadow is caught appearing to make a fascist salute. And at the end, after the professor expresses doubts that Clarici is at the heart really a fascist, he opens the shutters and Clarici's shadow disappears in the resulting light. In this way, Bertolucci uses the cave image to emphasize both the shadow world of fascist beliefs and Clarici's ultimately uneasy relationship with it. Raymond Boisvert suggests that the special enmity Clarici seems to have towards his philosophy professor is not merely the hostility of the cave dweller towards those who have succeeded in escaping the cave. His enmity arises, above all, because it was the professor who gave him the training and critical thought that makes it impossible for him to do what he most wants to do, which is to fit in with the fascist order, to conform. In The Conformist, the cave has been used in order to comment on forms of confinement in a wider social and political context. In Cinema Paradiso, the cave image figures in a tale that is primarily about an individual's journey out of childhood and intellectual confinement. As Eric Freeberger argues, Cinema Paradiso makes use of the cave image and indeed the parallel between the cave and the cinema to portray the development of its main character, Toto, towards adulthood and intellectual independence. In the film, Toto tells the story of his childhood in a small Sicilian village and in particular his childhood friendship with the projectionist at the local cinema. On Freeberger's reading, the local cinema can be seen as a cave-like place in which the villagers are spellbound and seduced, in effect bound, by the conventional opinions and standards of behavior that they see projected onto the screen. But Toto has already begun to escape from this cultural confinement because he's turned away from the screen and has come to know the projectionists behind the screen, behind the scenes. The liberating escape from the cave that Plato envisions is paralleled in the film's overall story, which traces how Toto gradually comes to escape from the narrow confines of small village life and heads off into the wider world to gain an education. Before moving on, there's one more portrayal of the cave worth noting. One of the most interesting cinematic experiences of the cave, once again in the form of the cinema, can be found in Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Here, the enslaving force is psychological conditioning in the service of the state part of a future totalitarian government's campaign to clear the prisons of mere common criminals. As a condition for his release from prison, the film's vicious anti-hero Alex is subjected to a kind of cinematic brainwashing. 
In this cinema, he is strapped to his seat, unable to turn his head away from the screen. Clips on his eyelids mean that he is unable even to close his eyes. Behind him, shadowy white-coated scientists sit with banks of instruments orchestrating the proceedings. She is shown a string of violent film images and with the help of drugs is gradually conditioned to feel sick at the very thought of violence. The result is a model citizen of sorts. This scenario strongly recalls Plato's cave because Alex is literally bound to his seat, unable to look away from the cinematic images, and because when he is brought under the sway of these images, his independence is destroyed and his behavior controlled. However, Kubrick's film also introduces a number of perverse twists that set it apart from other cinematic representations of the cave. In this cave story, going into the cave, Going into the cave actually brings about liberation at one level, in that Alex has to go into the cave to submit to the brainwashing in order to gain his freedom from the prison. Moreover, because having been brainwashed, he has now become a prisoner in a more profound sense. Kubrick gets us to sympathize with Alex, but at the same time, it is not at all clear that it would be a good thing for this particular prisoner to escape from his cave.